Friends and relatives, it is Mongo Slade now for three count commentaries. We're going to be talking about AEW Dynamite April 5th, 2022. I have a headache from the copious amounts of cake and ice cream that I'm still eating. I promise today is the last day. Birthdays are like holidays where there's a lot of leftover food and you're still nibbling on it, you know, days later. This is, I promise you, the last. I'm getting too old to be eating cake and ice cream. I feel like my head's going to explode. <laughs> I feel like my head's going to pop off and float away. All right, let's talk about news and notes. First, let's talk about the big announcement Tony Khan put out there. Uh, Wembley Stadium for AEW August the 27th. Uh, Wembley Stadium holds 90,000 people. They will obviously not get 90,000 people. Uh, so they're going to have to figure out what the setup is. Is the setup going to be 40? Is it going to be 30? It's going to be 20. Um, I'm interested in seeing what their numbers are in Europe. Uh, because look, unlike everybody else, I'm not going to jump all over them. I'm not, you know, either or when it comes to uh, Wembley Stadium. For me, these kinds of shows are just like wrestlers. Tony Khan has money, so he can get what he wants. He wants to run Wembley Stadium. He can get Wembley Stadium. He has the money. So this is, to me, that's what makes this not a big deal. You know, if TNA would have done it, because TNA had, like, no investment, then it would have been, oh, the company is growing, yada, yada, yada. But this is just Tony Khan swinging his money around. The question now is, what's the setup going to be? Is it going to be 45000 30000 20000 whatever? Um London as a city is a city of over 8 million people. It's a large city, very big city. So they should be able to swing 20 to 30,000, especially if you consider people coming in from outside of London. So people coming from various parts of England, various parts from Ireland and Scotland, etc. It ought to be a pretty big day. It's also very good because this is going to be their European debut. And Europeans, they love any wrestling that's pretty much not WWE. Uh, for some reason, TNA was huge there. And now uh, AEW is pretty big there. Uh, double back to what I said before. So I expect it to be fairly successful, but I don't expect it to be uh, SummerSlam 92. Um, people are already kind of trying to equivocate the two. It's going to be like SummerSlam. It's like, it's not. I doubt it's going to be like SummerSlam. But a big stadium show... Okay, is it uh, the big announcement that I believe it is that, you know, no, I, <laughs> the, the idea that we're going to promote this as some huge announcement, I, I this felt like he was selling wolf tickets to me, you know, this could have been a press release, who cares, like Triple H and nobody else feels the need to, you know, we're going to hold you hostage until the middle of the show to tell you about a, another show that we're going to do. Again, it's just like wrestlers to me. You know, you can have a show on the moon. It, it doesn't matter. It's all about, all right, what are, what are you going to put in the building? You know, what stories are you going to put together? What's your angles going to be? August will be here before you know it. It's already April. So that means you got four months. You know, what are you going to do? Um, now, a lot of people consider because of the size of the building that they probably did come to a, some kind of agreement with CM Punk. Look, I'm I'm done with that subject and unless he shows back up i really don't care whether he's there or not and they have to run shows whether he's there or not so the argument that we need to book around cm punk and what his wants are is irrelevant and i think that honestly do you really want to be the guy that goes groveling back saying oh my god i booked this stadium i need to have cm punk come in and sell this stadium now you just give him all the political power he needs to swing his uh his joint around, <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't do that. I would never let a, a one talent think that they could, you know, pull the show that much. It just doesn't seem to make much sense. You have to believe in your brand. And if you believe the brand is strong enough to sell out Wembley, at least sell out what you're going to make available, which is going to be different. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because they're probably going to make only like half the stadium uh, eligible, uh, upcharge a lot of the tickets, and see where we go from there, which is, you know, typical. But I'm very interested in what they're going to put on the card, you know, because AEW just seemed like we're going to book the biggest match we could possibly do and put that on the show. And a lot of people are already talking about, 
Osprey and Omega. And I'm like, okay, maybe for that audience. And that really will be for that audience, you know? So who cares? Um, it is what it is. I don't think it was a huge announcement, but that's, that's just me. You know, that's just me personally. I'm a hater of AEW. Y'all know this. All right. Another note, Jonathan Gresham, uh, did an interview recently where he talked about leaving AEW and why, and it really just boils down to, he felt like he was disrespected, um, for weeks leading up to him being demoralized, uh, before he lost the title to Claudio. He had been trying to get a meeting with Tony Khan and um, he felt like Tony Khan was avoiding him. He, he would say that Tony Khan was blowing him off. Uh, he talked about, you know, having conversations with uh, Christopher Daniels and having conversations with QT Marshall, but never getting that one on one time with Tony Khan. He tells one of these very weird stories of Tony Khan, him saying, quote unquote, he had to hunt Tony Khan down. And he ta finally talked to C Tony. Uh, Tony introduced him to somebody else. He politely shook that person's hand. And when he turned around to shake that person's hand, Tony had walked off. Like Tony was trying to avoid him. And he said, you finally talked to him uh, the day of the event. But by then he had already checked out. So it wasn't much, but it does say that Tony Khan, you know, if, if you're not one of his favorite toys, he doesn't have time for you anymore. It's like that, you know, the Toy Story meme. You know, he drops Woody in the box. You know, <laughs> it is, you know, <laughs> Jonathan Gresham was Woody. He got put in the box and that was it. Uh, very unfortunate, but it is what it is. I don't see that as being a big deal. Uh, Tony Khan, of course, came across as being very damn weird. And the Jonathan Gresham thing, almost as weird as he was in the announcement of Wembley. His eyes was like bucked wide open. As he tried to tell the story of All In and how these people were, you know, pillars or whatever the hell, founders of AEW or whatever. Um, but uh, it is what it is. Let's let that go. Um, Jim Johnston actually offered to do themes for AEW. He said that uh, there was no interest and there was no response or something like that. Poor Jim Johnston. I mean, he's been outside knocking on the door trying to get somebody to give him a job for like the last 10 years. And I wonder what this guy did. Like, what does he do? You know, like what did he do to anybody to be, you know, treated this way? Everybody used to, they used to sell his themes on CDs and I used to play them in the house, you know, like used to walk into the room playing like diesel steam and stuff like that. You know, it was, those were fun days. And now they act like this guy is like some kind of, washed up crackhead or something like that. Like, I don't know, man. I don't know. But I know that AEW has their own guy. I think his name is Ruckus. So they probably just don't need it and just don't see a, a use for it. You know, they're going to stick with the guy who, uh, who did their stuff, which, you know, loyalty. That's good. If I was Jim Johnston, impact could use some help. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you impact could use some help. But WWE, I, I just don't see why they won't. I guess the reason why they fell out is still the reason why they're not doing business right now. But if Triple H wants to, you know, dig into the nostalgia bag, I think that Jim Johnston making the the songs is the is the best way to win somebody like me over. If Triple H really wants to win me over, being the producer or booker or whatever the hell he is of WWE, if he's even the one running it, which, you know, it doesn't matter to me one way or the other. If he wants that, uh, that, um, my, my head pats, he's going to have to bring back Jim Johnston and make these theme songs substantially less generic. Jim Johnston had a good, really good knack for making these songs mean something. So that's all the news and notes now, at least for not right now. Let's move along, little doggy, to the AEW doing the mind. Okay, so we start the show with Juice Robinson and Ricky Starks. Um, as Ricky Starks gets in the ring, Jay White's music plays over the loudspeaker, and Jay White runs to the ring. Jay White and Juice Robinson then commence to whooping the ass of Ricky Starks. They stomp him out, beat him up, and then leave. Afterwards, Jay White is all elite. So Jay White has signed officially. AEW fans are rejoicing at Jay White signing. Very happy he didn't go to WWE. Let's talk about this for a moment. Clearly, 
you, they could have built up Jay White in order to make the return. Um, what they were doing, I guess, was letting people think WWE had signed him and teasing Jay White. And w- I know WWE did a little bit of teasing on Jay White because he was a free agent. But um, ultimately, he fits in AEW perfectly. He doesn't have to do anything. I thought maybe he'd go to WWE as a way of challenging himself because sometimes people do that. You know, sometimes people want the challenge of, you know, seeing if they can tackle that mountain. But otherwise, people just go to where they're most comfortable, where he can just be a pro wrestler, just one of many. And that's what they do in AEW. You know, the fact that they debuted him in this way shows that they're not taking him that seriously. He's not debuted at the top of the card. He's debuted in the opening match, hanging out with Juice Robinson, who has, what, one match on TV that he lost? So they didn't do a good job of really featuring Jay White. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. Um, It's a different situation, I guess, with Jay White because he's been on this show before. Um, He's also big to this audience. So this audience cares a lot about who Jay White is. And it is what it is on that front. But I'm never going to stop giving them hell for this really stupid way of introducing people, especially when this company is going to promote Tony Khan's big announcement. You can't promote Jay White. You can't promote Jay White has signed and will make his debut on. No, we're going to promote the big announcement, whatever the big announcement is. Whatever, you know, <laughs> it's silly. It's Tony Khan putting himself in the center of things. That's not necessary, man. You can you can promote your talent. You know, you can tease talent. You can build up, you know, um, tension. You can build up anticipation. You can do these things. You can get people excited. I, I don't. Whatever. Uh, but it's always got to be a surprise with AEW, you know, surprise, surprise, surprise. everything's got to be a surprise. So it is what it is, but, uh, I'm not that excited because to me it's Jay White doing what Jay White does, which is bullet club stuff. And he's hanging around with losers like juice Robinson, absolute wastes of human flesh, you know, um, genetic accidents like, uh, juice Robinson. But Jay White's going to be really good in this company. He's going to be a great TNT champion uh, eventually. Unless they, you know, Tony Khan gets his head out of his ass and he might be the world champion. Maybe. We'll see. Chris Jericho cuts a promo. Happy that Adam Cole is back, but felt that his elongated celebration was punking out Daniel Garcia. You know, Chris Jericho, known sportsman. Chris Jericho. Oh, no, you were unnecessary celebrations like the NFL. He was offended. So then he gets accosted by TV dad, Keith Lee. You are the poster child, Mr. Jericho, for disrespect. Perhaps yonder next week, I shall show you the definition of respect. And I felt like a laugh track was about to bust out. You know, somebody said that he looked like Uncle Phil, which is that was a slam dunk, don't you think? Like that one's a little on the nose, you know. There's nothing. There's nothing more perfect than Keith Lee being <laughs> being like Uncle Phil, you know. Uh, <laughs> get him a sweater. <laughs> Jericho versus Keith Lee next week. Not looking good for Keith Lee. That ain't looking good for him. Uh, Jericho lost to Action Andretti. He's probably about to beat Keith Lee. So, what was the point of Jericho losing to Action Andretti anyway? What was the point of that? Uh, what was the point of Finn Balor's top rope breaking? Oh, never mind. Uh, the House of Black defeated Orange Cassidy and Best Friends. Um, they they started doing the mama the mama ride again. So forget. I think it's Trent. His mama rode them to work again. You know now AEW is playing into nostalgia. It's pathetic. I don't care about this match. Christian is back. Luchasaurus is with them. Okay, I don't care about this either. Riho was uh, defeated by Jamie Hayter. Uh, yay. Some people act like they cared about this match. I do not. I do not. Riho looks like a piss dispenser. Outcasts say that they don't care 
about Jamie Hayter, but they don't want her to get too comfortable because one of them will become the AEW Women's World Champion, and they will figure out which one is going to be later on. Now, I'm guessing since they they booked the Wembley show, Jamie Hayter is from England. They're going to want to do maybe Soraya versus Jamie Hayter in Wembley. That's going to be my guess. And my guess is that's when Soraya will probably win the women's title. Um, though it probably should be Tony Storm, even though Tony Storm's from Australia, um, to the great dismay of Brad Maddox and Xavier Woods, um, Soraya can't do anything from behind, you know? And from Jamie Hayter's perspective, you know, she hits pretty hard. And that, that is true. And, you know, that's a nice little gimmick she got there. She's stiff. So if she's working with Soraya, she's going to knock Soraya's block off. And that's not really a good match to do, <laughs> if we're being honest. So maybe Soraya being the one is probably not the right move. So maybe I would go with Tony Storm personally, but I could see Tony Khan maybe wanting to go with Soraya and uh, asking Jamie Hayden to not kill her too badly. All right, so we got the answer of the acclaimed. They don't want to be friends with the Jericho Appreciation Society. That said, the Jericho Appreciation Society still booked a eight-man tag that featured these guys. So they're partners 2.0 and the acclaimed their partners on Rampage. Uh, moving on. MJF Day in Long Island. He gets the keys to the city. Some area called Oyster Bay, which sounds very all, very prestigious and white. Um, then there's a, a jazz band. MJF started singing. He started genius singing jazz standards. Uh, the saxophonist in this thing was awful. He was an awful saxophonist. MJF, decent singer. Um, why he was singing jazz music, I don't know. But I guess it fits his character. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, it was entertaining. You know, MJF singing and being multi-talented. It was very entertaining. But the promo. Jesus. Jesus Louise. The promo I could have did without. When he started talking about being LD in school and all this kind of stuff, I was like, oh my God, we're back to this again. Poor put upon MJF. Sheesh. His teacher told him he couldn't be anything because he was a read -re in school. He was on the short bus. Oh my God. Why is he constantly oscillating between being the outcast and being the coolest kid in school? Like, which one were you really? Were you the read -re on the short bus with braces that was getting picked on by call it Jew boy and getting your, your, uh, your, your little hat knocked off every week. Or were you the cool jock who was banging the cheerleaders and driving sports cars? Like who the fuck were you really, you know, make up your mind because you can't be both. The guy who gets bullied doesn't turn into the cool jock. You know, that just doesn't happen. Right. So, uh, yeah, make up your mind, please. Okay. So I, I could have done without that part of his promo. I also could have done without the part of his promo where he starts talking about how much he loves pro wrestling. That's a promo that get cut to way too much on AEW. I love me some pro wrestling. I was distracted by, by my daydreams about being world champion. I was like, oh God, ugh. No wonder your teacher thought you was going to be a fucking loser. You were in school daydreaming about being a world champion. and I was watching wrestling just as much as you did. I never daydreamed about being a world champion in wrestling. I didn't dream about touching titties. My priorities were in the right place. You know, all I'm telling you, once I realized like being world champion was possible, I didn't care about that. I wanted to touch titties. All right. That was my thing. You know, that's, I, I guess I might've been like 11 or 12 years old when that became like primary focus in life was to touch a titty. You know, good day when that actually happened, brother. I'm telling you, that was a good day. Anyway, uh, MJ's promo was entirely too long and focused on his love of pro wrestling, which is great. Um, I don't understand why he's a heel, except when they're in this area. Then all of a sudden he's a baby face that's forced and stupid. Um, at least when they did it with Bret Hart, uh, the actual audience was the one that was doing it. Bret Hart was the same character everywhere he went, but his act was different. In Canada, where they actually liked him, 
You know, he would say the same thing in New York that he would say in Toronto. The difference would be the response. MJF literally plays a baby face in Long Island and then starts talking about how he's going to, you know, jack off on somebody's mom when he steps right outside of Long Island. It's like, it's ridiculous. You know, that, that kind of separation is just literally too much. It's dumb, but whatever. AEW going to do what they do. Uh, what made this weird? Jungle Boy attacked MJF. Jungle Boy was in, is it was in the band with the symbols and crashed the symbols, broke everything up. MJF cussed him out, yelled at him. They started choking him. Uh, as he was choking him, Sammy Guevara came out to have his match with Commander. Which, could you imagine how the, the, the creative process went for this match? Young Commander, young guy, he's like 20, 21 or something like that. He's about to be on national TV again, you know, this time for, for a one-on-one -on -one match. He's been booked a couple of times in AEW. He's not like a, a complete rookie to the process. But Sammy Guevara tells him, hey, you're going to do your big run across the ropes move, and I'm going to counter it twice. How about that? That's like when uh, Scott Hall walked up to Bubba Ray Dudley. Nice finish you got there. Can't wait to kick out of it. You know, like you're going to do your big run across the ropes move. You're going to do it twice. But I'm going to counter it twice. Wow. That's really going to make you look great, right? Fuck out of here. Uh, Sammy Guevara wins, then proceeds to cut one of the worst promos. Oh, Sammy Guevara's promos are awful. Sammy Guevara's promos are terrible. Terrible. Just terrible promos. And of course, because AEW is all about wrestling, he's all just did what MJF is scared to do, and that's wrestle. I'm like, oh my god, he's a world champion. Okay, he's the world champion. He wrestled Danielson in an hour. Long match. We should be off the subject of MJF doesn't wrestle. All right. Get over it. He doesn't have to. All right. From there, he starts um, talking about MJF's band, saying, what is this, American Idol? <laughs> I felt so bad for that crowd. It felt like everybody was being kidnapped collectively for like six minutes as Sammy Guevara struggled to talk. It was the shits. So he starts talking about how MJF didn't beat him. Sean Spears did with a chair. How MJF, you know, was was Cody's friend and he wasn't. And he was Jericho's friend and he was Moxley's friend and he's everybody's friend. And, you know, MJF didn't build his own part of this pillar. He didn't build it himself. And he you know, says it's built by all the people you used and manipulated. Then it says that MJF sold his soul, which is something he'll never do. I was just like, please wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up, you know, clown shit just wrap this shit up look i can't believe you know that the guy who booked wembley stadium thinks that it's smart to give sammy guevara microphone time but not ricky starks you know sammy guevara should be talking not ricky starks whenever somebody starts talking about how tony Khan's a good evaluator of talent or something like that be sure to bring up the people that he thinks should be cutting long promos are like Jungle Boy and Sammy Guevara, right? They suck. Both of them do. The fact that he's trying to sell a pay-per-view that features both of them in the main event is beyond me. Jungle Boy seems to be the one that's really feuding with MJF here. Sammy Guevara is on the outskirts. And I don't think Darby Allen has had anything to do with this storyline since it began. Is he dead? Is he injured? Are we going to just bring him in next week? You know, we're going to, you know, give each guy a week to focus on their internal beef with MJF, uh, I guess. But Sammy Guevara, they need to keep him away from the promos, uh, you know, just ban him from promos. He needs to be fined if he cuts a promo. You know, if he talks on TV, you should just fine him 500 bucks. If he try, if you hear him calling spots in the ring, you should find him five hundred bucks. I don't want to hear your voice on this show. I don't see how they got rigged into this. Sammy Guevara is a pillar. Like Sammy Guevara is a joke. He's a an absolute joke. Jesus Christ. He is without a doubt. Yeah, he's the worst. Sammy's the worst of the pillars. He's awful. He's not a good baby face. He's not a good heel. He's not likable. His matches make no sense. All he do is spots. And his persona, I guess you could say, 
is based off of people not really liking him, but he can't capitalize off of it because he can't stop doing stupid spots. He doesn't know how to get any real heat outside of people just don't like him. So Sammy sucks. But at least I'll say I'll give AEW some credit. The way they blended these three things together was pretty good. They had the MJF thing and it went so long that they wove Jungle Boy into it. And then the Jungle Boy MJF fight scene where they were being separated uh, opened up an opportunity for, for Sammy Guevara to make his entrance. Then Sammy Guevara has his match. Then Sammy Guevara was able to roll that into his promo. So at least they weaved these things pretty naturally, which was good. And it keeps you engaged. So if you're engaged with MJF and Jungle, MJF, what he's doing, then Jungle Boy attacking him is going to be interesting to you. Then Sammy Guevara is coming out there. And if you, you know, hadn't turned the channel yet, you get to watch him wrestle Commander. And um, after that, he talks. Now, personally, if I was a normal individual, the moment I saw Sammy Guevara, I'd have changed the channel. OK, but I'm not a normal person. Uh, what whoop de do uh, hook defeated Ethan Page. Ethan Page was mocking Matt Hardy and Matt Hardy abandoned Ethan Page after the match. Basically just gave up on him. I don't know what they're doing and I don't care. Um, hook is still carrying around this FTW title. It's been three years. Well, it's been a, at least a year that hook has been walking around with it. Uh, Brian Cage walked around with it for a while. Ricky Starks walked around with it for a while. What does this thing, what is it for? Like, what is it leading to? You know, it would be nice if this was a storyline. You know, there's a storyline reason for him to walk around with this. Which is, I think, what I said when they first started this thing. Like, what's the end game for it? You know, if it's just going to be some thing that we just defend because we have to have a title match on the show it's like it's not official it's not it's still not an official title so why does he still carry it what does it mean you know why does hook have that weird tattoo in the middle of his chest well right in his bread basket he's like got an airplane or something like that tattooed right there what is that about you know i don't, I don't know everything about this is confusing to me and i'm very disappointed uh, Hobbs is going to be on some stupid battle of the belts, not defending his belt though, but in a tag team match with QT Marshall. I wanted to throw my TV, you know, um, Hobbs has not been on dynamite since he won this championship. Wardlow has not been on this show since Hobbs won that championship. What have they got against Hobbs? Why is Juice Robinson on this show? Why is Sammy Guevara talking on this show? Riho gets TV time, but Hobbs doesn't. The Blackpool Combat Club, they beat up some J-Brones. Afterwards, Danielson cut a great promo. Talked about how much he loves each individual member of the Blackpool Combat Club. How he loves pro wrestling. And how these jabronis that they just beat up are not real pros. At the Blackpool Combat Club are the only pros in this business. That these guys are amateurs. The kind of guys the EVPs would, would hire. Amateurs. So, Hangman Page marches down to the ring because, you know, he's very serious. And he attacks Danielson only to get beat up. Uh, as, he's there, as they're whipping his ass, uh, Danielson is calling Hangman Page an amateur. He then weeps out, what weeps? Yeah, he weeped it out. He weeped out a screwdriver, licked it, and then proceeds to stab Hangman Page in the face with a screwdriver while calling him an amateur. Uh, I love Danielson. Danielson is tremendous. Danielson is, he's amazing. I will praise, like I said, he's the one guy in AEW. I like every, pretty much everything he's ever done. But where do we get the screwdriver from? Why do we go to that level? You know, um, and I get it. We're going to do the whole we're pro wrestlers and now they're taking it to the extreme. You know, it's pushing the Blackpool Combat Club to a higher height because they already were saying like we're pro wrestlers and, 
you know, they were saying it in a way to get uh, cheers first. And now they're doing it in a way where they're getting heat. And this is real character building here. Real character motivation is that they didn't change that much. They just became a little bit more violent. And they started doing a lot of their real pro wrestling stuff, quote unquote, to baby faces. So, which is a good character turn. They've always been sort of the the bruisers, the tough guys. And it made sense when the Jericho Appreciation Society were the quote unquote sports entertainers and they were glitz and glamour and they looked goofy and all that kind of stuff. And it made the Blackpool Combat Club come across as being very cool. It came across like a, a dojo or a gym or something like that. People who take this kind of stuff seriously. Now they come across like sadists. You know, they enjoy beating people up. They enjoy inflicting pain. They enjoy hurting other people. This is good. And the crazy thing is, it's the same characters. That's what makes it good. They always enjoy beating people up, but they enjoy beating up heels. You know, they enjoy beating the shit out of sports entertainers. Now they're saying that they're the only real sports entertainers. They're being purists, similar to what the foundation was in uh, Ring of Honor um, before TK bought it. You know, the foundation was kind of psychotic, almost like a cult about pro wrestling and what real pro wrestling was. Um, man, that was good stuff. I, I wonder if you guys actually watched it. If you go watch some of those Jay Lethal promos from that time, oh, he was really good. He was like a preacher for pro wrestling. It was good. But um, the Blackpool Combat Club coming across like that would be great. And um, so I'm not upset about this i'm just kind of surprised that we went with a screwdriver you know like that's not really pro wrestling is it like well i guess maybe it's like abdullah the butcher <laughs> you know like i guess if you count abdullah the butcher as a pro wrestler uh then yeah i guess you know he had forks and screwdrivers and sharp shit all the time i guess so phenomenal promo by danielson i like how danielson like uh chooses a word and he focuses on it you could tell he learned in wwe like when he started doing fickle, fickle, like he really gets that word over. He's really trying to get over amateur. So he's just calling everybody an amateur. It's good. It's great. I like Danielson. Main event, FTRs versus the guns. Uh, title versus career. You already know what was going to happen. Now, the guns come out to 50 cents mini men. And I was like, this guy, Tony Khan, every week. Just shows you how he knows he knows nothing more than how to spend money. What the fuck does many men? How does that fit the guns character? Okay, you could many men with the funny all in my dog and I can't see. I'm just trying to be what I'm destined to be, and then trying to take my life away. Many men, many 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 men. Okay. Okay, um, everybody, I know, yes, everybody hates the guns, sure, but do they hate the guns that much that I would spend whatever exorbitant fee 50 Cent would ask for for this song, just for this match, and then for them to lose? No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, but I guess it popped the crowd, uh, you know, it was in New York, so I guess, and it got people talking about them online, I guess. Um, I enjoyed the match. Um, until it got, it got a little weird at the end where, you know, cash stops the referee from disqualifying them, disqualifying the guns, but they did have some really good tension in terms of some really good near falls as the guns try to cheat, you know, they were switching the titles and stuff like this, trying to use the titles as weapons. So I, I really don't shit on the guns as much as everybody else do. I actually have a pretty favorable view of the guns. You know, everybody else gives them a hard time. For me, I like it. You know, these guys are trying to come into their own. They're doing the best that they can. I do think that they probably had the belts too long. And I know they weren't champions that long. I'm just saying that they should have been fluke champions. And if they were going to lose them, they should have lost them to the acclaimed. Them losing them back to FTR, I don't see the reason for that. You know, um, I guess they, I guess, I mean, they did have a story with FTR. Because they kind of sent FTR home. So I'm not saying that there was no story there. But for me, I would have said 
the acclaimed. I just want to put the belts back on the acclaimed and to let the young teams do their thing. But um, pretty much anybody with a social security number and a heartbeat knew FTR was going to win this match. You know, um, Tony Khan doesn't seem to do business in a way where guys lose and, on TV and literally go away. You know, it's more like guy complains about creative and then you don't see him for eight months, you know, like Miro or Andrade. I know Andrade just had surgery or something like that. It's like, it's crazy that he has surgery for it. I'm pretty sure he got injured, taken out the garbage or something like that. Cause I don't think he was hurt when he got sent home, you know, like, I think, you know, wrestlers just be like, man, I'm sitting at home anyway. Let's just go have surgery, dog. You know, like, fuck it. I ain't doing nothing else. I'm just going to go have surgery. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just about to, I'm about to go get fixed up, dog. I'm about to go see the wizard. You know what I mean? I ain't, I ain't got no job this week anyway. I'm going to go see the wizard, you know. But um, FTR, good in-ring generals. Them sticking around AEW is a smart thing to do. Um, don't see a problem here. Was it a worthy main event? Yes. Was it a believable main event? Not really. The moment they, it was titles versus career, you knew FTR was going to win. And the guns were screwed. Because they, they could lose and they'd be safe. And, you know, the guns can want to rematch. And you can always rematch them some other time. And, you know, FTR can finally stop bitching and whining and complaining about how they're, they're not, the tag team division is not built around them. And now it is. Okay, now we can stop FTR balls bitching about the tag team. We thought the tag team division was going to be built around us. Okay, now it is. All right. Uh, the Young Bucks are not in the tag team division anymore to rival you or to get on your nerves. So the tag team division is all about you. Okay, so let's see where it goes. Now, um, hopefully they don't end up like the Lucha Brothers where they just ended up on damn Rampage for six months. Or whatever the f <laughs> the entire time they were champions, they were on rampage. Um, so, uh, but FTR, they're one of Tony Khan's guys, so they'd probably be all right. Um, I think a, a lot of people hyped this show because of the the big um, debut at the beginning, even though it wasn't really much of a debut because again, Jay White had been there before. But the big signing at the beginning of the MJF segment, the announcement, but. I didn't care about any of the matches outside of the, the main event, which is good for me because at least I cared about something. Uh, Danielson's promo was very good. MJF's chicanery was okay. I didn't hate it. It was different. Uh, it, you know, created something different in the show. I felt like it went too long though. And that was like the only problem is that it was probably too much of a, a break in the pace and MJF doing way too much in terms of, he gets to sing, and then he gets to cut a long promo, and then he gets in a fight segment. It was like, okay, they're doing way too much on MJF here, and they just seem to are running out of ideas on how to keep him on the screen for a long time. Um, human Scarecrow, Riho, was out there, and I don't mean she's a Scarecrow because she's outstanding in her field. I mean she's a Scarecrow because she's made of straw, and she's skinny. That's why. Um, they didn't see why that match, you know, needed to be the length that it did. Praise Tony Khan for changing his mind on Juice Robinson. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we got a, got a promo and a visitation from TV dad, Keith Lee, which was fun. I got to do my Keith Lee voice. That was great. Uh, Jericho is mad about something. Nobody cares. Uh, and mostly it was okay. You know, mostly it was an okay show, uh, good energy throughout. I just wish that Hobbs or Wardlow or somebody of real interest was featured on this show more often, you know, rather than just try to make it the MJF show, you know, why not give Sammy Guevara's promo time to Jay White so he could talk about why he's here and give a mission statement of what his plans are and that kind of thing. Or, you know, that's what I would have done personally. You know, I would have given that promo time to somebody else. <laughs> so... Jay Cargill wasn't on the show, also wasn't featured. Also, I don't think it was even talked about. But she will be defending her uh, women's title, TBS title, against some Billy Starks. Now, here's the weird thing. Now, Billy Starks is a weird, really weird case. Because that For You tab on Twitter, that's a motherfucker. Because a lot of stuff that I don't want to know ends up in that For You tab. And 
she was retweeted onto the For You tab. Um, so I saw somebody, somebody that I follow, found out that she was actually in high school. Like she went to like a GCW show or something like that, and then went to prom. I was like, how old is this girl? Apparently she's like 17. She, she and, uh, there's a kid, I think his name is Nick Carter or something like that. The fuck is his name? Nick something. He's also 17. And they have like provisional uh, AEW contracts where, you know, they can't formally be signed, but there's kind of like a promise note that when they turn 18, there's a contract waiting on them. And I was like, okay, you know, but she's 17. We got to stop signing these wrestlers so young, man. Most of them are not worth it. <laughs> okay. And, and AEW doesn't have a developmental. So what the fuck you need with a 17 year old? You know, you have no developmental system. What are you going to teach them? You know, you're going to let them go back on the indies and wrestle around broken glass and drunkards and shit. Like, come on, man. At least if you had like a facility or something where you could train them, it'd be okay. I still don't think you should be signing 18 year olds. They should at least be 20. At least, at least go to college for two years or something. Go to the military or something. Go get a life experience. That's one thing I really hate about wrestlers today. That's one of, one of the things that I think is a very, very, very underrated aspect of the wrestling business that nobody talks about is how wrestlers in the past all were like, you could, and a lot of people don't read wrestling like history books and stuff, but if you did, you know, like a lot of wrestlers and boxers and stuff like that were drafted into the military. So they had like old war experiences, you know, people, they, they've traveled the world already, you know, they've gone through boot camp they they're tough they've gone through some shit and then they go into the wrestling business you know where they go through some more shit but at least mentally they're ready for it because you know they play sports and they play sports for a long time and you know mentally physically they're they're developed they're ready for the job and almost all of our favorites have done like some serious stuff you know not always not all of them have been like in the military and you know that kind of thing not all of them especially in modern day a lot of the modern wrestlers say wrestlers from the 80s and 90s most of them have never been in the military but before then a lot of them wrestled in like college and high school and they played football they were multiple sport athletes you know and they went into the military and some of them even wrestled in the military like bobby lashley wrestled in the military you know guys with some life experience you know and they can bring that life experience to wrestling. You know, now it's all just what, like MJF. I was in a classroom dreaming about being a pro wrestler. It's like, oh, did you do anything else in your life? Like, what else did you do, bro? You know, I, did you travel? Did you see anything? Did you write a great story? You know, did you, what did you do? You know, it's nothing. So that kind of, it kind of informs his character and MJF is a great performer, but his character doesn't have a lot of depth to it. You know, a lot of the depth to the character feels kind of hollow because it's all just high school shit. It's all just school shit. Even though MJF is 26 or something like that, it's all school shit. If you were 26 in 1985, that means that you would have been born in the 1960s. It means you would have led through the seventies and the eighties played football Probably got drafted to the military. Probably did a tour somewhere. You'd have been 26 for sure, but you, it'd have been, it'd have been weighing on you. You know, you might have been a bouncer at the club, you know, with, with the strippers like Scott Hall was, you know, you might have had some real life shit. <laughs> you know, that happened. You'd be a grizzled 28 year old, you know, but now all of our 26 year olds are all pampered and shit. And it comes across like that through the TV. And it definitely comes across through, through that on the, on the, on Twitter and shit, on YouTube and everything. You see a lot of these kids have never had any adversity, not for real. And they run away from tension. So they don't know how to create tension. They're uncomfortable with it. And <clears throat> I have a problem with that. You know, like the, there, there's no way a Roxanne Perez would be anywhere near a wrestling ring in, you know, 1995 or something like that. She's small. And she has no personality. It wouldn't matter how many good, how good she could do a wrist lock. She'd have been a jobber. 
She's small. She's a child. And she has no goddamn uh, life experience. You know, maybe after a couple of years, they, you know, find a role for her. But there's no way. You know, these Sammy Guevara's and these these uh, Billy Starks's and these Carters and shit. It's like, I don't... These are these people are just kids. Like, there's... Di- I'm starting to really kind of sift the wheat. Like, there's different from young people and fucking kids. You know? Like, the mentality is different. Like, you could be 26 and be a fucking kid. Because in your mentality is not mature enough to handle the situation that you're in. But you could be 26 and be a grown ass man too. You know, you could be 26 and be like, look, you know, I've been on my own since I was 16, eating broken glass and rolling around in heroin needles or whatever. You know, Cause some people are, they had rough lives, you know, at, at 16, 17, they got put out of the house. You know, they lived, they were homeless for a little while, you know, like that stuff really informs your character, which is why I'm, I'm always surprised when I hear somebody you know, be kind of soft and they had like a tough upbringing. Like Keith Lee used to sleep in his car. Like that's some real killer Mike shit. You know, like you hear stories about killer Mike, like the rapper killer Mike. That's what I'm talking about. Who used to be homeless. He's sleeping in his car. You like, damn, he, he really wanted it. He like, you hear about JK Rowling. She was homeless when she was writing like the, the, um, Harry Potter books. At least that's what she, that's the story she told. Like that hunger, no, you don't, that, you know, you know, that, that never give up. That's, that's something that most people will never face. And to be able to bring that out, you know, it's something special. But if you've always had somewhere to go, you've never been hungry. You've never been punched in the face in your entire life. You went to prom and you graduated high school and you have a high school sweetheart. And you know, basically your life is a fucking uh, movie from American Pie. Nobody gives a shit. All right. You're boring. You suck. And that's what a lot of wrestlers are today. A lot of them are failed theater students like Darby Allen. I wanted to be in movies, but that didn't work out. It's like, oh, God. Okay, great. You're a failed gymnast like the Young Bucks or something like that. I don't know. How did I get off on this tangent? Oh, I was talking about uh, Battle of the Belts, right? Because um, Jay Cargill was going to be wrestling that Billy Starks kid. Um, I hope Billy Starks is okay. Um, she's she's cool with me. Just she's a child, <laughs> you know. Like literally, she's a child, and I don't see what to be gained out of child wrestlers. To me, I just don't think it's a good idea. I don't. I, I don't think Thea Hale having a job is right now is a good idea. She's very energetic, you know, but she's fresh out of high school. It's like what? What the fuck? Now they are capitalizing a little bit on it with the the Chase University thing because it's kind of playing into what she would what she would and should be doing. And I think she is still in college. She just kind of does it on, you know, wrestles while she's in college. But still, it's probably not a good idea. I would send motherfucker this is where J- Japan whoops America's ass. You know, I think I worked my way into this. Like the Japanese, they get their wrestlers young too. They put them in a boot camp. Where they do neck bridges and they beat them with sticks sometimes. And, you know, they used to back in Tatsubi Fujinami's day. They beat them with sticks and shit, you know. But now they they run them through a boot camp and then they ship their ass away. You know, that's what we need to do. It, that's why I've really been suggesting with NXT. If you're going to sign like a Thea Hill, run her through the performance center for a couple of months. Then ship her ass to Japan, ship her ass to Europe. And say, see you in two years. You know, <laughs> we'll, we'll, you'll have a job when you get back. But, you know, unless you break your goddamn neck or something like that, then don't bother coming back. But, you know, go learn something. Go travel. Go see some shit. You know, go watch, you know, wrestling in different places. Have different experiences. Understand that it's not always going to be WrestleMania glitz and glamour. That sometimes these people wrestle in bars for onion rings, you know, just go get some life experience because it'll make you a better performer, not just studying tape, not just I watched Bret Hart matches. So what you spent your life watching Bret Hart matches, you have no personality, you know, go read something, go read some profound shit and let that inform your character. 
You know, it's too many manga cosplay 17 year olds. I, I know I'm getting old now. I said yesterday that I don't think I'm getting old. But today, I, I'm pretty sure I am. Because that 17 year old shit triggered shit out of me. And I was like, get the fuck out of here with this. There's nothing I can gain from a 17 year old pro wrestler. Unless she just came back from the war. There's nothing I really can gain from her. You know, it's just going to be another kid out there with a little kick pads and, you know, taking Instagram pictures and shit. That shit's not interesting to me, man. We, we, this is a business. It's not a fucking social club. And AEW is running like a fucking social club. It sucks. And WWE to a degree too, but there's a lot more business minded people over there, but they want it to be, the crowd wants to be, want it to be a social club though. Where everybody's friends and everybody likes each other. Fuck that. You know, if if you can make money and do that, great. If you can't, even better. Tension makes money. You know. So enough. Sorry. Sorry for rambling. Hope you guys enjoyed Dynamite. Uh I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out.